So winter's coming. It's just around the corner. What I have here is a whole basket full of winter squash. And the name is a little bit confusing because these don't come available in winter. They're planted in spring and they're harvested in the fall, but they take their name because they last really well all winter long. If you harvest them in October, let's say, uh, there's every likelihood that if you keep them in a dark, cool spot that they'll be fine the following April. Anyhow, uh, I don't have a huge selection because we're a little bit uh, early, but let's take a look at what we do have. I've got here a butternut squash, and its name tells you a little bit about its flavor. It's buttery, it's soft, it's velvety, and it has a little nutty appeal. It's a delicious squash. Uh, here I've got a kabocha squash. This is an Asian squash very, very heavy for its size. And that's something that you should look for in any one of these winter squashes. When you pick it up and heft it, it should feel heavy. If it doesn't feel heavy, what that means is a couple of things. It may mean that it's already beginning to dry out, or it may mean that it has a lot of seeds on the inside and not much meat. Now, if we look at this squash, uh, when it's immature, it will have this hard shell on the outside, just as it does now, but it'll look a little bit like linoleum. It'll look shiny and, and hard. Um, as it ripens, as it reaches full maturity, it turns a little bit dull. And you can see that in all of these squashes here. It's not shiny any longer, it's a little bit dull. Um, so that's a good indication of a squash that's reached full maturity. Should have a corky stem on it. And then it's not a bad idea when you're lifting it up to give it a heft. Look around and make sure that there's no field scars on it, no scars or bruises or cuts. Because as soon as this hard shell is cut, the moisture from the interior can get away and bacteria from the exterior can get in and suddenly you've got a lot of problems. Um, let's move this aside. And we can get started with a dish that is called squash carpaccio. I'm going to use butternut squash. Here's how it looks uh, with the peel still on. And when you peel it, uh, you don't want to use a vegetable peeler. Instead, get your chef's knife out. Use it to pare the hard rind of the squash off the outside. It takes a little bit of time but this is really the tool of choice. So just carry on peeling all the way around the outside. If you use a vegetable peeler, you're really not gonna get anywhere. Anyhow, I've got one of these that's already been peeled. And so let's cut it in half and see what we've got. One of the things I love about these squashes is that the seed cavity is always very small. So here's the squash. The seed cavity is just down here, and this is all solid meat, so a really high yield. Okay, the way to get rid of the seeds, just take a spoon, and what we're gonna do is come in here and scrape those seeds out. You know, this shouldn't feel very different from getting a pumpkin ready to carve at Halloween. So next step, let's cut this in a way that would be appropriate for carpaccio or very thin slices. I'm gonna take the knife and I'm gonna cut it probably just a little bit less than a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, that may not seem thin to you, but when it cooks, it will shrink up a little bit. So uh, I would say that's entirely appropriate. Take your time, cut it nice and even, so that when we put it into the oven, it cooks evenly. And when you get down to the portion where the seed cavity was, don't worry, just keep going. When you're cutting this, take your time. It tends to be a little uh, woody or a little tough, and so uh, the potential for the knife slipping and cutting yourself is real. I'm gonna take this pan, and we'll put a little bit of olive oil onto it.
I'm just going to brush that oil all over the pan. And then we'll lay the squash on. Okay, a little bit of olive oil over the top. We'll just brush it on. And you should have your oven preheated to about 450 degrees. This is sliced so thin that it will cook really, really quickly. And I would encourage you to cook it hot enough so that it takes on a little color. I think that's a nice contrasting flavor to the sweetness of the squash. Salt and pepper. When you sprinkle on the salt, come from high because then it falls in a broad pattern. Whereas if you're down here, sometimes you get too much salt in one area and not enough in another. So come up nice and high and the salt will fall evenly. Likewise with the pepper, come up nice and high. Now we'll take this to the preheated oven. And pop it in. Now, that won't take but 12 or 15 minutes to cook. I have here one that's already cooked. And once it's cooked, it can certainly come to room temperature without any difficulty. You can see it's shrunk a little bit. That's why we cut it a little bit thicker. And it started to brown. So that's just what I'm after. All right. So the next step for this recipe is to make a sauce that goes along with this. Now, this is going to be nice and sweet. There'll be a little bit of bitterness that comes from the browning, but I want a sauce that's full flavor with a lot of savory flavor. So it's going to start out with sour cream, or what I'm using here is Greek yogurt. I think that's plenty rich enough. We'll add some yogurt into the bowl. And then I want this to be a little bit thinner. So I'm going to add some cream. All right, we'll evaluate the consistency in just a second, but let's talk a little bit more about flavor. Uh, let's think of this as aioli. So any aioli without garlic is not aioli. We'll crush this clove of garlic. And... I want this to be a nice uniform paste so that nobody gets a big mouthful and that this is kind of a creamy, creamy dressing. So use your knife with a little bit of salt acting as an abrasive to create a nice, uniform, smooth garlic paste. Okay, we made quick work of that. We'll just stir that in. Now, this recipe came to me from a chef from Mexico or possibly Central America. I'm trying to remember right now, but uh, it's no surprise to me that she introduced some heat in the form of habanero peppers. And so I'm going to take and we're going to add habanero to it. Now, this habanero pepper is likely one of the hottest peppers you will ever bump into. It is... Um, a 10 on a scale of one to 10. And uh, I'm gonna suggest that you handle it a little bit carefully. Uh, wash your hands after you're done with it so that you don't touch your face or your eyes or something like that. I'm gonna cut it in half. And there is the ribs. Uh, sometimes you'll see the ribs sort of glistening with an oil. That's capsaicin. That's the compound that gives these chilies their heat. And if we wanna get rid of some of that heat, we can come in here and just cut those ribs out. We'll probably take the seeds out as well. And that will tame the fire that is a habanero. Then we're going to cut it up. And we want to cut it up very fine. The flavor of this is not just spicy hot. There is a remarkable fruitiness to this chili. Um, so fruity, in fact, that sometimes I think of it almost as artificial flavor, tutti frutti. You know, it tastes like apricots and peaches and pineapples and bananas and things like that. And you get to enjoy that fruitiness for about four seconds, and then the heat starts to kick in. But I think when we add it in a moderate amount, we'll get kind of a compelling heat 
with a nice aroma. Because you're the chef. You know, you can come down here and you may just get a sense of, of that fruitiness just from smelling it. All right. I think we're good to go. Next, we're going to put some anchovies in there. Now, uh, anchovies you can buy in a can. Usually they come packed in oil. Sometimes you will find, and these are becoming more and more popular, salt-packed anchovies. If you find them, um, take them out of the salt, rinse the salt off, and you end up with a fish that looks like this. And what you want to do is just pull the filet away from the bones. And I'm just kind of curling it away there, just like that. And then I'll flip it over and I'll do the same thing. This is now the filet coming from the other side. And I'm just left with the bones right there, which can be discarded. Uh, I talked to a friend who just came back from Spain and he was in a bar and these were fried and served up as a little hors d'oeuvre with drinks. Now, let's see what we've got. We have anchovy fillets, but you may discover that there is some part of the entrails still in play that need to just be trimmed away and discarded. Maybe there's a little fin that can be pulled off and get discarded. And now we've got plenty of anchovy fillets, okay? So here's some that I cleaned earlier, and we're going to chop them up. And what these will do is lend a wonderful savory flavor to our aioli. If you don't like the idea of dealing with salted anchovies or anchovies at all, if you decide you don't like anchovies, uh, here's an option that you might consider. That's miso, white miso from Japan. And it has a savory flavor, and while it's a different savory flavor, I don't think it would be inappropriate here. And you can just mix a little bit into your garlic sauce, and I think that would be a fine substitute. You can make a paste out of these anchovies as well with your knife, which might be appropriate. And let's gather them up. And... You know, if it looks like I'm putting a lot of anchovies in, that's a lot of squash right there. That's a great deal of squash. And so uh, try to keep things into perspective. A little bit of salt. Still thick, so I'm going to add first some more cream. And then a little drizzle of nice extra virgin olive oil. And with the cream in there, this should emulsify really nicely. Looks great. Garlic is there. The anchovy gives it a nice savory flavor, and it just wants a little bit of acid. So here's some lemon juice. And I'm happy with that. It's time to think about building this dish. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is lay the squash onto a plate, and then I'd like to squeeze a stream of the sauce out on top. And so to facilitate that, let me show you how to make a simple pastry bag. I have a piece of parchment paper right here. Um, this is the kitchen parchment that you put on sheet trays to keep things from sticking. I'm going to fold it corner to corner. And then I'm going to cut it into a triangle. So there's the triangle that I'm thinking of. And what I would have you do is hold the triangle up like this and take these three fingers and put them opposite this point. So here's the long portion. Here's the short portion, and opposite that point are my fingers. I'm going to take this and bring it around and create a cone and use those three fingers to hold that cone. All right? 
And then holding it tight with these three fingers, I'm gonna roll it up, roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it, until it's all rolled up. And then to hold it in place, I'm gonna fold this end under. Just fold it right inside the cone. And there's a little impromptu pastry bag that we can use for, um, for our decor here in just a second. I'm gonna make a single portion of this, uh, this carpaccio for you. Next, take your pastry bag and carefully put some sauce right down in the bottom. You wanna try and keep the top as clean as you can because that's where your hand needs to hold on to. And we'll set that aside. And I'm gonna fold the top in and down to contain the filling. And then we need to cut the end so that we can get some of the, the goodness out of this pastry bag. Come here, there we go. The next step is we're gonna put some arugula on the top. And we're gonna scatter leaves of arugula over the carpaccio. And then we were out in the garden today and I found a couple of things. This is a nasturtium. And a nasturtium is in the same family as watercress. So if you like spicy greens, let's take some of these blossoms and just scatter them around. The nasturtium leaves are also delicious. Our gardener introduced me to pea blossoms and they taste just like uh, beans. And then a couple of other edible blossoms here. Finally, some toasted pine nuts. A little bit of uh, Parmesan that gets shaved over the top. I'm just gonna put a drop or two of lemon juice over those greens. I don't wanna weight it down. I'm gonna put just a little drizzle of olive oil. and then we'll season with salt and pepper. So we created the dressing right here on the plate, and that's all there is to it. Butternut squash carpaccio with arugula salad. So today I'd like to make a soup with you called Tom Kagai, chicken coconut milk soup. But because we're taking a look at winter squash, I thought I would take the chicken out and replace it with winter squash and other vegetables. Um, what I have here is a butternut squash that's been diced up. I peeled it, diced it, and we're gonna put it right on this pan, dress it with a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper, and it can go into the oven and roast until it's tender. It's not gonna take very long. It takes maybe five to eight minutes, okay? So on it goes. When it's cooked, it's gonna look pretty much like this right here. And you can tell if it's tender just by eating a piece. All right. That tastes great. I'm gonna turn a pan on and we'll get started with the soup. The thing I like about this beyond how wonderful it tastes is that there's an opportunity to learn an awful lot about Southeast Asian food and the flavor profile and the ingredients and the techniques. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, in this pan, I'm gonna create a flavor base. I'm gonna start with some oil. I'm using olive oil here, neutral oil sometimes. Uh, you'll even see them use coconut oil. So in that flavor base, I'm gonna add some shallots. 
And the shallots have been sliced up. I'm going to add some garlic, and that goes right into the pan. I've got lemongrass right here. Here's kind of a signature ingredient in Southeast Asia. What we want to use is the meaty portion that's right down here, not the green tops. And so I'm going to take and get rid of the stem end, and I'm going to get rid of the tops. These oftentimes make their way into curry pastes. And what I'm going to do is take the balance and cut it up to become part of this flavor base. Now, you'll see it used a couple of different ways. Sometimes it goes into stews and they just take a big chunk and they bruise it like this with the back of a knife and they throw it in as though it were a bay leaf and people know not to eat it. But if you do choose to cut it up, make sure that you cut it up pretty fine. It tends to be woody and if you're not careful, it's a little bit like uh, getting a piece of wood in your soup, all right? So we'll gather it all up and then we'll make a point of slicing it up really, really fine. It has the most remarkable, clean, citrusy flavor. Um, it, it's really a foundational ingredient in Southeast Asia. It just smells great. It's citrusy, but not acidic. So don't expect it to be sour. Um, it just, it, it's almost like the zest of lemon. And once it's cut up, that becomes part of your flavor base. Now, a couple more things. I have here sambal ulek. This is basically a chili paste, and there's a number of different chili pastes that you can use. This is one that I like from Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia actually, and you can find it easily in most groceries. Sambal ulek, O-E-L-E-K. And you can add it depending on how hot or not you like your soup to be. So it's pretty spicy. If you really like it spicy, you can grab for some pepper flakes as well and add those. We'll stir that around. I've got it over a low heat. I don't want to brown this at all. I just want to cook it. And then the last ingredient that's going to go into this flavor base is this right here. It's something called galangal or galanga. Um, it is a rhizome, just the way ginger is a rhizome, and you can see the similarity there. Uh, in terms of the differences, this one tends to be a little bit harder and deeper flavored and woodier, and this one tends to be softer and a little bit brighter uh, and more aromatic. If you can't find galangal or galanga, go ahead and use ginger, which is pretty readily available. The way that this makes its way into my soup, and you can see how, how hard it is, is that we're going to take and cut it into coins. So think about the size of a quarter. And we're going to add those coins, again, almost like they were a bay leaf. And people who love this soup recognize that they're not supposed to eat this, but if they find it, oftentimes you'll find them sucking on it and enjoying the flavor. All right, that goes into our soup as well. The flavor base is done. Once the shallots are translucent, once you can smell the garlic, once the lemongrass has had a chance to cook, you're off and running. That can be done ahead. You can set it aside off the heat if you want. But the next step is to add stock. And I'm using chicken stock, but you could use vegetable stock as well. And I'm going to put some stock in the pan. I have it hot already, which will make this process go a little bit quicker. And then, in addition, I'm going to add coconut milk to it. Now, coconut milk is a product that you buy canned. Uh, it's readily available. What you'll discover when you open it is that it's non-homogenized, so there'll be a lot of coconut fat on top. Don't discard that. You want to include that as well. Basically, what coconut milk is, is the flesh of the coconut that's been grated, mixed with hot water, and then wrung out. So all the fat comes out, all the flavor comes out, and that's going into our soup as well.
Okay, as this comes up to a boil, we have an opportunity to season it. The seasoning that you will see used in all Thai kitchens, all Vietnamese kitchens, and throughout Southeast Asia is something called fish sauce. And fish sauce is made by taking small fish like anchovies, and once caught, you put them in the sun and let them dry and ferment a little bit, and then you pack them into barrels with salt, push the barrels out into the sun, and forget them for about eight or nine months. But what they discovered was an incredible savory flavor. You may have heard it called umami. Um, sort of a mouth-watering flavor. It's an ingredient that somebody really needs to uh, encourage you to use the first time, because if you didn't know any better, you'd say it smells like bait. All right? So how do you use it? Well, you add it almost like you would add salt. You put it in there until your soup tastes salty enough. We're almost there. And then there's two other ingredients that are almost always side by side with fish sauce. One is sugar and the other is lime juice. Now the sugar goes in there and what we're looking for is a balance between saltiness and sweetness. The lime juice goes in there as well, but because it's aromatic, I don't want to add it until right at the end, just to kind of brighten up the soup and preserve the aromatic nature of it. Okay, we've made the flavor base, we've added liquid, we've seasoned the liquid, and now that it's come to a boil, I want to add some vegetables in there. Here's some corn. This time of the year it's in season, so I figured we'd use it. And here's some mushrooms, and we'll put both of those right into our soup. Now, by the time it comes back to a boil, both of them will have been cooked. So it, it won't take very long. The other two ingredients, vegetable ingredients that I'm going to add, are tomatoes, and because tomatoes are so tender, I'm gonna add them right at the end. I'm gonna add the squash right at the end because it's pre-cooked. And then the last thing will be the seasoning and adding aromatic ingredients that I don't wanna drive off their delicate perfume. Here goes our squash, and I'll just scrape that together. And then tomatoes. Sometimes I'll take Roma tomatoes and cut them up, but I don't peel them, I don't seed them. Today I'm just using cherry tomatoes. Now, from this point on, this soup should be finished up in just two or three minutes. I don't want the tomatoes to fall apart and for this to become a tomato soup. It's a coconut milk soup, so the tomatoes should maintain their integrity. I'll bring it up to a last boil, and we're going to add the aromatics. Cilantro kefir lime leaf or wild lime leaf, and lime juice. First, the kefir lime leaf. Kefir lime leaf is the leaf from a wild lime, and if you take the leaf and you crush it up, it's tremendously aromatic. Um, sometimes you can find it in the market. If you do, buy it and just throw it into the freezer. About as close as you're going to come to a substitute would be lime zest. And it's not bad, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. And I'm gonna add the lime leaves, just in big pieces like that. And then I'm gonna add lime juice, and I'm using this to brighten the soup and to counteract or cut through some of the richness of the coconut milk. And then the final ingredient that we're going to add is cilantro. That goes into the soup. And we are ready to serve. And then finally, let's lay on a sprig or two of cilantro. Tom Kagai, not with chicken, but with roasted squash. So a couple of years back, I had what I thought was a fun idea. I wanted to take a custard and bake it inside of a pumpkin. The idea being that I would create sort of a pumpkin pie in the pumpkin shell 
and that I could take it right to the table at Thanksgiving and everybody would ooh and ah and I would look like a hero. So um, I tried it out a couple of times. It came out pretty well. Um, I wanted to show you something similar, but of course pumpkins this time of the year aren't really available. Uh, so we're gonna use an acorn squash. And I'm gonna take, because this won't sit flat, it won't sit on that little point, I'm gonna make a little collar for it. And we'll use that collar to hold it upright and then we'll put it in the oven and bake it. Figure about 350 and it's gonna take an hour, uh, an hour, something like that. What I wanna do is open this up so that we can put custard inside. So I'm gonna take my knife and I'm gonna cut all the way around the outside down at an angle, just like that. And we'll lift that up and out and we'll get rid of the seeds. I'm gonna scrape the seeds out of the top here. And then we're gonna take the rest of the seeds. I'm gonna take a fork and what I wanna do is pierce and sort of break the structure of this squash and poke it into the flesh and give it a little twist all the way down. If there's chunks of the squash that break away, it's not the end of the world. They'll just become part of the custard, okay? So what I'm gonna do is make sure that hot custard goes into hot squash and back into an oven so that it will cook very quickly. Let me go ahead and put this back into the oven. Okay, I want that nice and piping hot. Uh, let's plan on leaving it into the oven about, well, 20 minutes or so. Uh, that'll give us just enough time to make our custard. I have some milk and cream right here. Think half and half, basically. And usually when I heat it, I put a little bit of sugar in. And if you've not seen this before, this sugar is actually granulated maple sugar. You can find it in stores. Um, but the nice thing about adding some to the cream is it changes the cream so that it won't scorch and burn on the bottom of the pot. The remainder of this sugar is going to go in here with egg yolks. And I have a wet towel over them because they form a skin very, very quickly. So uh, what we wanna do is add the sugar and then whip these. All right, lighter in color. It smells of maple right now. This is really a nice recipe. And then I'm gonna temper this. I don't wanna add this to the hot liquid because I can guarantee you I'll have scrambled eggs floating around in cream. So we'll bring the temperature up slowly. First, a little bit of liquid, and I'm gonna stir it in. And then a little more liquid and stir it in. And little by little, what's happening is I'm bringing the temperature of these eggs up. I'm tempering them so that I don't shock them and cook them. Once they get warm, I can be a little cavalier about how fast I add this. Good. And then I wanna flavor this. I've got two flavoring agents right here. One is coffee extract. And I love it with the flavor of pumpkin. Not a lot. I don't want it to overwhelm the flavor of maple. And then a little bit of vanilla extract as well. So we've got the custard done. While it's hot, I wanna take the squash that's in the oven and hot, bring it out, and we're going to add the custard into it. So we've got hot squash, hot custard, hot oven, and then we'll put them all back together again in the oven and make sure that that custard gets done. All right, in goes the hot custard. And we're gonna take that, turn the oven down to about 325, and we'll pop it in there and it will likely take another 35 or 40 minutes before the custard is set. And by the time that it is cooked, the squash is soft enough that I can just bang it once or twice on the table and it will sit flat. It'll flatten out on the bottom. I have a plate here. I'm gonna put it right into the plate. 
and we're gonna put some hazelnuts on top, but I want these hazelnuts to be spiced, and so I've got some allspice and some cinnamon, and a little bit of sugar, a little bit of that maple sugar, and we'll just put those things right on the nuts. And then, if we want those seasonings to stick to the nuts, what better way than a little bit of bourbon? So bourbon spiced nuts is what I'm, what I'm offering here. Uh, don't put so much that they get soggy. Just enough so that the seasonings will stick. And then finally, uh, this dish isn't complete unless these have some salt in them. It really tastes great when, when you get a little bit of salt in this garniture. All right, we'll spoon these over the top. And then what I like to do to present it is to put the lid back on, take it to the table, and everybody's wondering exactly what's going on here. And what you can do is actually take a slice of this and put it on the plate and share it with somebody else. Or if it's a small group, just take the top off, give everybody a spoon, they roll up their sleeves, and off they go. When the weather turns cold, the tenor of cooking seems to change just a little bit. The flavors get deeper and they displace the bright flavors of summer offerings. The pace of cooking seems to slow down a little bit. The oven gets turned on more often and it warms the kitchen and the house as well. With a grand variety of winter squash on hand, things like the giant blue Hubbard or a banana squash, maybe a turban squash, a sugar pumpkin, or a small delicata squash, you've got the ingredients you need to put delicious food on your table.